I'd like to call to order the joint public meeting of the Glendale City Council and the Glendale Redevelopment Agency for March 22nd, 2011. And we have roll call for the council, please. Council members Draymond? Here. Friedman? Here. Quintero? Weaver? Here. Mayor Najarian? Here. Roll call for? Roll call for the agency, please. Agency members Draymond? Here. Najarian? Here. Quintero? Weaver? Here. Chair Friedman? Here. Your report, please. Currently, the agenda for the March 22nd, 2011 joint public meeting of the Glendale City Council and the Glendale Redevelopment Agency was posted on Thursday, March 17, 2011, on the Bolton Board outside City Hall. First item, please. One is public hearing, Director of Public Works and of Community De Development regarding parking standards in downtown specific plan. And 1A is Council Resolution adopting a negative declaration. 1B is the Ordinance for Introduction amending Title 30 relating to parking amendments in the DSP zone. 1C is Ordinance for Introduction, adding Chapter 1.26 pertaining to administrative citations for violations of certain provisions of Title 30 in transportation demand and parking in lieu fees. D is Council Resolution adopting parking in lieu fees for the DSP area. And E is a Council Resolution adopting a schedule of civil fines for administrative citations. Uh, thank you. This is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing. And go to Mr. Starberg. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll ask Mike Nilsson, Mobility Planner with Community Development, to uh, introduce the item with the staff report. Michael. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. Today we are presenting draft code language, fee resolutions, and environmental analysis related to amending parking standards within the downtown specific plan area. This is an ordinance being considered for introduction today. The ordinance being presented to you this afternoon has been part of a two and a half year effort collaborating with stakeholders, staff, commissioners, and council members to implement parking management recommendations in the downtown mobility study, a companion document to the downtown specific plan adopted by council in 2006. These amendments help realize the downtown uh, specific plan's vision for a vibrant, walkable downtown. Some highlights of the code amendments include reducing the minimum parking requirements for residential and some commercial uses. It also includes opportunities to satisfy parking requirements through paying an in-lieu fee and allowing tandem and mechanically stacked parking to count towards parking requirements. It also allows opportunities to further reduce parking requirements through transportation demand management programs such as carpools, van, uh, van pools, ride shares, transit passes, and transportation man uh, management association membership with requirements for new large-scale commercial and residential projects to join transportation management associations and conduct transportation demand management programs. It also increases the exemption to provide parking for existing change of use businesses from 2,000 to 5,000 square feet, which covers most of the parking exceptions granted in downtown over the past five years. With these incentives, we have proposed greatly reducing the need for discretionary parking reductions through removing the parking exception process for the downtown specific plan area. However, the existing variance parking reduction permit and parking use permit processes will still be available as discretionary options to reduce parking in the DSP area. For Council's recommendations, we have also added a provision in the ordinance to projects that have already reduced their par uh, parking under the State Affordable uh, Housing Density Bonus Law to not be eligible for downtown parking incentives proposed today. The code language has also been updated to reflect the input from planning commissioners and transportation and parking commissioners uh, per their comments at the February 28, uh, 2011 meeting. These comments include additional language for enforcement of in-lieu fee and transportation demand management requirements, and that's reflected in the fee resolutions and fee ordinance presented today. Uh, and a more detailed explanation of the transportation demand management programs and specifically how they're eligible for parking reductions has also been passed out this afternoon on the dais. This concludes staff's presentation. Uh, Bonnie Nelson from Nelson Nygaard is also available to answer uh, any questions regarding code changes and policies in further detail if council is interested. Thank you. Uh, so you're going to hand it off to Bonnie? Yes, sir. Uh, um, can you go through these these ordinances for us and just give us a uh, summary again as, as to what you did, what you're presenting to us for introduction? Uh, Let's start with the. Uh, well, I don't Mayor, know which one. Uh, Mr. Mayor, sorry. Before you start, I, I wasn't sure if you opened the hearing, so if you yeah, haven't, if I you, did. Okay, good. Right off, right off the bat. Um, okay, we're talking about. In lieu fees? 
Correct. We're talking about uh, change of use increasing from 2,000 to 5,000. Yes. And the idea behind this all is to um, set down a series of rules so that everyone doesn't come to us and ask us for the parking variances and parking exceptions that, that we invariably end up hearing, on, sometimes on a routine, sometimes on a special case basis. Uh, I think, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned it. Exactly. That's the, the number one purpose, to, to streamline the process. It really reflects a lot of the procedures that we have followed over the past several years. It's all in one code. And it also connects, uh, all of these policies are connected to the greater downtown mobility study policies that they work hand in hand to implement some of the other pieces that uh, we, you have been discussing for the past few years, including the Lufis. In other words, in, uh, now there is a mechanism if you reduce parking for to get something in lieu of that if uh, the parking use permit which is the use of off-site parking is not used or if there is no uh, justification for reducing the parking standards for a particular developer there's a <coughs> new mechanism introduced that uh, now allows uh, allows uh, the, the staff to make recommendations to the council agency to consider those okay let's let's talk about the in lieu because I've received a, a phone call today from a stakeholder whose complaint was that the $24,000 per, uh, per space in lieu fee uh, is too high, that it should be set lower, and that should council see that there is an excessive amount of use of this in lieu fee program that it then be raised up. I am going to ask Bonnie Nelson to really actually address the fees, because that's the one time in lieu fee for uh, every parking space that's forever uh, given right. up. I believe you have in the staff report for this item a chart that we developed that shows how the $24,000 fee would stack up against other peer cities. And as you can see, you are definitely not the highest in, the, in this chart. The $24,000 is approximately the average of the um, fees that have been updated in recent years. So some of those that are at the low end, if you can see on that chart, some of those that are at the low end are fees that have not updated in quite a long time. And in fact, cities that have very low fees that don't update often run into problems where the fee is, is simply too low. At 24000 we are also recommending that the fee increase with inflation so that you don't have to come back for new ordinance every time you have an inflationary cost, and that will put you at about the mean of the of what we would consider the modern uh, uh, one-time fees for in lieu spaces. I don't consider it too high because the cost. This is in lieu of building a parking space. The cost of building a parking space, particularly if you're building subterranean in Glendale, can be fifty thousand to eighty thousand a space, depending on how far you have to go. To, uh, to build that parking space. So by doing an in lieu at 24,000, there's a benefit to the developer to not have to build that and a benefit to the city to be able to accumulate some funding to eventually allow you to build more parking if necessary. Okay, does this save us from the developers who want to come back up? Last in lieu fee we had was for affordable housing. Um, and we were several memorable <laughs> requests for waiving of the in lieu fee or lowering the in lieu fee, setting this figure at 24000 and, and this implementing this ordinance doesn't protect us from any individual developer coming in and saying, you know what, that's too high, I want to pay 10000 a space in lieu. I mean, Albert. it sets our goals and priorities and our target. A developer can ask, uh, uh, any new developer can ask for anything they want, I suppose, but the in lieu fee is only one tool. What we've tried to do is to offer a variety of tools. So a developer who feels that they, uh, the parking requirement cannot be met on site has a number of tools. They can do a shared parking. Uh, arrangement. They can do off-site parking. They can reduce their parking demand through demand management and or they can pay the in-lieu fee. So we've given a menu of options to really incentivize economic development downtown without penalizing people who want to shop, work, and, and travel downtown. The in-lieu fee is only one of those tools. I can't stop a developer from coming to you with any kind of a request, but we've hopefully given enough options in the menu here that you will be able to um, come to an agreement. I might add this, this uh, a couple of things. One, procedurally, 
the fact that it's adopted by ordinance means that in order to amend it, you'd have to go through an ordinance amendment, which procedurally is going to be a few more steps than you'd normally do if you were just able to come to the City Council and ask for a waiver, say. Secondly, my biggest concern is that, that we may miss the mark too low. <laughs> and indeed, then you'll have some major developments when the economy comes back that will see it as an economic incentive, especially with subterranean parking, to not build their parking and instead give the city the responsibility for that. I'm more concerned this may be too low than that this may be on the high side. Uh, in the end, if it's on the high side, you will hear from developers very quickly. If it's on the low side, frankly, we won't. We'll just have a big project come in. They'll ask for an in lieu, and then we'll realize it's costing us far more to build it than we're going to be getting back out of it. And at that point, you'll learn because you had your first one come in, and you'll be incurring a loss on it. So 24000 is generally what we think of as about the construction cost of subterranean parking. Now, that doesn't include the land value. If you're building subterranean, you're having to acquire the land anyway. But if somebody's doing surface parking, indeed, you haven't accounted for the land value in this, although this construction value may be higher, certainly, than what it normally costs you to build surface parking. But most of these that we see where we're asked for um, waivers is where they're having to go multi-layers of subterranean. The farther down they go, the more it costs per space to build. So there's a, a large incentive to get down below two, two and a half, three layers there's a large incentive to ask for an in lieu because it gets very expensive. Would these funds be earmarked and put in a special account for future parking they would, structure? They would be a uh, part of the parking, uh, the, the downtown parking uh, fund, and the, they are allocated towards either building new parking or towards other projects that would reduce the demand for parking. So uh, it's uh, all parking add, related. Let me add to that. I, I don't know if it's addressed in the ordinance, but I think we'd also want to have a system where we're keeping track of this on a rather large territory by territory basis, so we're looking for funds produced in, say, the downtown area to eventually go to producing parking in the downtown area. Right. That's right. In terms of the timing of implementation, assuming this is adopted, would this affect something like the uh, theater lofts uh, project? Uh, the theater lofts project would probably not be affected by this, because, but there are other mechanisms in the code that we can use right now. Okay. But and if, I might add, you have a separate, you'll have a separate development agreement on the theater lofts project, right. which will address all of the, uh, the various aspects of that project, including parking. That's right. Give me an example of how this would be applied. The uh, Broadway lofts? Well, let's use an example. Let's use uh, one of the projects that, that may come back, but for now it's one of those that, that fell off the map as a result of the economic downturn. Uh, either the, the, let's take the, the project of Joanne's Fabrics. They might very well have requested an in lieu. They were going to be subterranean. Uh, housing based on our previous housing standards, which may, now they may be getting some level of relief on that. But they might have come in and, and asked for uh, some in lieu payments for a portion of their parking on site uh, because they were going subterranean, and they might have requested some level of a number of spaces, say that if they were going down three, maybe they only wanted to go down two, and they would have wanted to pay in lieu on the balance of that. Uh, if it made economic sense for them, and if from a service standpoint they felt their project could be successful while not having all of the parking on site. Do we have a limit? And let's say yes, 50 percent. 50 percent is limited. No more than 50 percent of the parking requirements could be uh, in met through in, in lieu. Right. And then another thing that I might add is that um, you know, I think that your question, your original question, Mr. Mayor, is really a good one. And for those developers who might be watching. Uh, off your sets. All the developers right. turn off your sets. Uh, just by, rec yes, they can ask for everything, but they, can, they should still show that they are eliminating the parking impacts because the full in lieu fee will assume that they have eliminated the full parking impact per in lieu fee. However, if they do, they ask for waivers, they will still have to eliminate the parking impact. And through, that another, will, through other means. Through some other means. Whether they, yes, they need to show that there is no parking impact. And that is subject to our review still. Spoken enough. Colleagues or? Um, yes, thank you. If you will indulge me, I have a number of questions. I think you may have asked a few of them. Um, this is only in order of the staff report. My first one is on page four, and it's about the um, um, the parking incentive reduction based on proximity uh, to transit, based on the um, you know the the state. What is it? What is it? A B. What is that actual? Doesn't matter. Whatever that. Whatever the state incentives give them to be close to oh, transit. Oh, SB 1818. 1818. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little confused because we're. We're limiting that ability, or are we only limiting the city of Glendale's um, transit um, bonus? 
Or do we, do we have the mechanism to also limit the state? Do, there are two separate thoughts here. One is, in the original proposal, we had um, identified a uh, parking reduction, a, re a reduction in parking requirement for being close to regional transit. One of the comments that we got back from the commissions was that transit in Glendale currently is not at a sufficient level that you could really give a parking reduction for being close to regional transit. At, in the future, there may be transit improvements that would allow that to happen. So we've taken that out of the ordinance. The issue with SB 1818 is that developers um, under that provision, which is a provision that provides for uh, lower income housing, get certain benefits as a part of that, one of which is parking reduction. We don't want to double up and double count those benefits That's by giving. Thought. And right. so that was one of the comments that came from council at our last meeting. We've just made it so you can't double those benefits. Okay, so they still have the benefits under the state under state law okay. absolutely they likely have to pick and choose which one they want to come on correct right they right. want to work with us on the incentives or they want to come in under 1818 but you can't get double coupons on this okay <laughs> um, the amendment to raise the parking exemption for change of use within the downtown specific plan zone from 2,000 to 5,000 square feet for tavern general office at all um, my question is why um, why are we Never mind with that one. <laughs> We're raising the limit right. of size. That's that's fine. But why is that? If I could take up on that. Many of the historic storefronts on Brand are in the range of between 2,000 and 5,000, and we want to really help small businesses that want to acquire that that storefront next door, or that want to open a storefront that's a little bit more than 2,000. Many of those changes in use have come before you in terms of exceptions, and actually a, a significant percentage of the exceptions that you give are exactly for that purpose. So so we wanted to say that by right, up to 5,000 square feet, you can have an exception. That will allow those historic storefronts and brand to stay occupied. Can, can, can I just can I add a, a comment to that, though? And this was a concern I expressed. Uh, this same provision uh, came up several years ago when we last visited our parking standards, and I expressed the same concern then. For some of these uses, such as the gymnasiums and health clubs, if under that you can have the 24-hour fitness type operation that could be rather intense, I get a little concerned about buy right for those kinds of uses that can go from 2,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet and buy right not have to address the parking impacts. Now, for many of these uses, maybe it's not a concern. Maybe, it, maybe it's okay in the downtown area. But for something that may be a, very, a rather intensification of a use, and again, we, we know from 24-hour fitness that they can consume a tremendous amount of parking. I just thought for some of these kinds of uses, we need to be very cautious about how we give a buy right provision, which means you don't have the ability, if it doesn't work, except to go back and change it for the next ones coming in, but you'll be stuck with those uses forever if they become problematic. How large is 24-hour fitness? Are they over 5,000 square feet? Oh, I think they must be. Yeah. Because I think, most, I mean, most gyms in my are. Mind, that's sort of why, in my mind, that's sort of why we have that 5,000 square foot limit, because I don't think a use that's 5,000 square feet and under as it is it is at as much risk of generating that kind of intense use. So right. for the larger uses that are the more intense uses, we'd still have the ability to look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Uh, I agree. And for most of the uses, I wouldn't be overly concerned. Uh, frankly, eliminating gymnasiums and health clubs, however, in the downtown area, I'm not sure that like restaurants and entertainment establishments and maybe even offices that they bring you the kind of benefit that you'd want to see in a downtown in some of the older buildings that you can still give them, you can still exempt them from it or give it a waiver, but at least you'd be able to look and see what is their intensification. Okay, let's, let me finish my questions and maybe we can take that up a okay. little bit later. Um, so in terms of the, um, the portion that allows a change of use to satisfy 100% of required parking, um, and for new construction to satisfy 50%. It makes sense for me to have that 50% limit in uses that are things like residential and maybe large-scale commercial. But if someone's building a small 5,000-square-foot store in the downtown, we don't have a lot of that kind of infill, but we could. Why then can't they have the same benefit that other storefront merchants have of not having to have that parking? 
The 2,000 to 5,000 square foot rule is, um, uh, is true for all. The 50% applies only to tandem and stack spaces. And the reason to,、um, to keep that to 50% is that in commercial establishments, you generally want independent movement. You want people to be able to get in and out of parking spaces without having to jostle other cars. I'm looking at the paragraph that talks about the annual fee for change of use. Oh, I'm sorry. In that, sorry, I didn't make that clear.、Uh, in the i n l o o In the inlu. So, why should new cons- 32, 172. Right. And that's, in the in- that's actually referring to the inlu fee.、Mm-hmm. And the reason is that we don't want to allow developers to be able to inlu 100% of their parking. There are other techniques that they could use, including off site parking, shared parking, other techniques, but we don't want them to be able to simply write a check and get out of the requirement to provide new parking when they are, providing, when they are adding significantly to parking demand. Okay, that makes sense.、Um, in the very next paragraph, where you talk about the $600 per year per parking space,、mm-hmm. is that for the property owner to pay or the tenant to pay? Or doesn't it matter? Doesn't matter. Okay. And then how. Is that enforced? I know you talked about、um, municipal ordinances, but is, that, is it realistic that we would be able to enforce that on an ongoing basis?、Uh, Madam Chair, what we've done, one of, one of the ordinances that's part of this packet is、uh, administrative citation process specifically for this particular fee because I think we had a similar concern. They have to pay the, f- the f- annual fee the first time at the time of their ZUC or their building permit, and then after that, pay it on a yearly basis. And if they don't, we would be using this administrative citation process、uh, to enforce that. So we- that way, we don't have to go through the more traditional code enforcement process to enforce it. And you're confident that that would. That would be satisfactory. That would bring,、yes. bring them into compliance. Okay.、Yes. Now, you did mention that the 20, you're recommending, and I think it must be in here somewhere that I didn't see, that the $24,000 per space in Luffy goes up according with the rate of inflation、yes. or a yearly basis. What about the $600 per year parking space?、Does、yes, also- those fees will adjust.、Um, sorry, I have to. No、actually, navigate electronically through this thing. <laughs> um, Least expensive way to navigate. <laughs> you don't need a travel agent. You don't need a travel agent. Some of these are, are redundant questions. One minute. Okay, so we talked about the density bonus. Um, okay, that's all my questions for now. Thank you Thank very you. much. I have some cards from the public. If、uh, someone d o n t want to go, I might come in later. Rick Lemo. Just walked out. Okay. Dennis DiPietro. Good afternoon,、uh, council members and、uh, agency members.、Um, Uh, Rick had to leave,、uh, so he added a voice. We, we are in support of、uh, Americana and, uh, and uh, speaking as a property owner and as an architect and as a former、uh, member of several of the, uh, the public uh, 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 in, uh, uh, public committees that have been involved in, in these earlier processes with zoning and so on. We're speaking in favor of、uh, the council、uh, agency adopting the、um, resolution uh, uh, for this、uh, parking. It seems like it's, a, it's another step forward in the whole process of trying to streamline the process and、uh, trying to make the uh, uh, development uh, process a little bit more dynamic, uh, uh, empowering more of the staff and being able to make these、uh, kinds of decisions that are. Wise and,、uh, and allowing、uh, developers and current、uh, property owners to、uh, more dynamically use their property. Thank you. Thank you.、Uh, I have a.、Uh, just one question. This is only then for the downtown specific plan, it would not extend、uh, any further than the. SP. This is for the downtown specific plan area only. And we'll have no impact outside of the DSP. If someone adjacent to the DSP said, that's a great idea, please let us、uh, 
have availability of such similar I'm sure you will see them standing where I am. <laughs> in lieu or tandem or mechanical stacking. We, we expect that, that those types of requests will come in, but like everything else, that with every new idea that we have wanted to experiment with, we have usually introduced them in downtown. Then we have all tested and tried them with your supervision on them. And uh, when time comes to expand some of these policies citywide, we will all f have a certain level of comfort at this point. Uh, you know, we are not ready to recommend them for across the city. But uh, in, s in the future, I I'm sure, at least in certain commercial areas, we might want to consider them. All right. Uh, thank you. I don't have any other cards. I will close the public hearing. And these are ordinances for introduction. Uh, they all council? They're, they're all council ordinances. And you do have resolution, a couple resolutions. Uh, Mr. Weaver for what for introducing yes ordinances sure let's see if we could the uh, right if we could adopt at least you uh, want to do a first one a one a yeah. so we I'll have move one a first that's the neck deck there a second second roll call please council members Raymond yes Friedman yes Carol Weaver hi yes I'll introduce the ordinances at one B and C noting that this these ordinances can always be amended in the future due to public request, which will probably come forth someday. And I'll move 1D and E solutions. Thank you. Roll call, please. Council members Raymond? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Carol? Weaver? Aye. And Najarian? Yes. Your next item. Item two is also a public hearing, Director of Community Development regarding Museum of Neon Art Project, Mona, to be located at 212 through 216 South Brand Boulevard. At 2A is an agency resolution approving a lease agreement with Mona and Healthy and Safety Code Section 33433 Summary Report. B is a council resolution approving a lease agreement with Mona and Healthy and Safety Code Section 33433 Summary Report. C is agency motion approving Stage 1 and Stage 2 Design Review subject to comments and conditions. E is an agency motion approving sign variances based on findings and conditions. E is council resolution making health and safety code section 33445 findings and determination. F is agency resolution making health and safety code section 33445 findings and determination. G is a council resolution approving a cooperation agreement with the agency. H is agency resolution approving a cooperation agreement with the city. Thank you. This is a public hearing and I will open the public hearing. Uh, members of the City Council and the Redevelopment Agency, uh, the next two items are being presented to you together as they um, help implement a vision that was actually uh, set into motion back in the mid-90s through the Greater Downtown Strategic Plan. Um, you may recall that that plan had envisioned a town center district in the downtown, the southern end of the downtown, with the west side of Brown Boulevard being developed as a regional retail center and the east part of Brown Boulevard, the eastern part of the town center district, to be developed as a series of civic-related uses, which included the, uh, a new adult recreation center, renovation of the Central Park, renovation of the Central Library, and potentially museums and pedestrian spaces. Um, in 2000, uh, pardon me, when the agency was acquiring property for the Town Center project, now the Americana, the agency also acquired a series of properties on the east side of Brand Boulevard with the vision of implementing a pedestrian passageway on that side. Um, and you may recall that in 2009, uh, the agency reconfirmed some of the principles that had guided the strategic plan back in um, 95 through an, uh, 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 pardon me, through an adopted master plan, uh, which helped us um, guide the development of the Mona building as well as the proposed pedestrian passageway. Um, at some point, I will turn over the uh, mic to our urban designer, Mr. Anna Loomis, to refresh your memories of some of the guiding principles behind the master plan. But uh, before I do that, there is, I just want to outline some of the items that are before you, uh, put them within a context. Um, in terms of Mona, uh, the Museum of Neon Art, um, uh, 
um, Ms. Ms. Kim Koga, the executive director, along with the board, um, Ms. Uh, Kathy Foley, Annette uh, um, Johnson, and uh, Mr. David Svensson are all here, and they're anxious to express their excitement. However, they have to be patient with us as we have sort of a mini presentation before we get to the MONA item. Uh, but in terms of MONA, they have been in existence since the early 80s with the purpose of collecting and housing neon signs that were quickly becoming extinct. Uh, that sounded very exciting. They were looking for a new house, a, a new permanent home, as uh, they were outgrowing their space in downtown L.A., and were excited that they began to look um, in Glendale for their permanent home. Um, The museum seemed to be very consistent with what had been envisioned with the Greater Downtown Strategic Plan, as the demographics are consistent with uh, those that are currently uh, at the Americana, shopping at the Americana, but they're also cap giving them a, an extended stay when they come to visit the Americana and the downtown Glendale. They also, uh, Mona, its existence as a museum, also helps us anchor the Arts and Entertainment District at the southern end and potentially will help us activate the proposed passageway. What's exciting about Mona, and I'm leaving this for them to touch on, are the community programming that they will be sharing with, uh, with, the, with the community once they come on board. Um, before you is a ground lease, uh, pardon me, ground lease agreement, and uh, um, Mr. Mark Berry is here, who has been the project manager negotiating and finalizing that agreement. If you have specific questions about the lease terms, I will uh, turn the mic over to uh, Mark to answer those. However, I'd like to reiterate that the, the business terms are very consistent with the letter of intent that was adopted, um, I believe, September of 2009 between the agency and MONA. Prior to approving the, the grand lease agreement, the agency by law has to um, review and adopt some findings, specifically 33433 and 33445 findings, and our legal counsel can definitely answer questions related to those findings. Um, and finally, the passageway is envisioned to be activated by MONA and potentially connect our uh, visitors at the Americana and South Park Brand Boulevard to all the, the rich civic uses we have on the, on the east side. Um, as you know, the Adult Recreation Center was, uh, uh, the new facility was completed a few years ago. Uh, our parks uh, department is working on revamping the central park area. Uh, the central library is in the process of retaining an architect to redefine the purpose of the reading room and it's, uh, the reorientation of the entrance and the access to the, to the central library. Um, going back to uh, the ground lease for a quick moment, I forgot to mention that based on the ground lease terms, the agency is required to uh, provide some uh, shell improvements to the building before turning the building over to Mona. And those improvements are uh, limited to structural, uh, HVAC system, plumbing, and electrical upgrades. Um, there is another item that's uh, on before you, it ha and I think in a nutshell it, it has to do with la land swap with the owners of the property that uh, are at the south end of the block at the corner of Colorado and, um, and Brand Boulevard. That specifically relates to a DSP envisioned uh, uh, improvements along Central Avenue to introduce a right turn lane at that corner. When Central Avenue was improved almost a year and a half ago with uh, street trees, street lights, uh, new sidewalks, that right turn lane wasn't implemented because the city did not have control of that property. The property owners at that, lo at that corner have approached staff with an idea of doing a land swap where uh, the almost 12 feet that's needed to accommodate that right turn lane could be, could be accommodated to the city with swapping a 12-foot parcel almost equal in size along the alley. The designers have looked at that and it seems to be working just fine with the proposed uh, design that will be presented in a moment to you. It also helps uh, complete that right turn lane as envisioned by the DSP. And furthermore, it helps the developer, uh, uh, gives them the opportunity to redevelop the site and provide uh, parking on site. 
The agency retained the services of Joey Shimoda with uh, uh, Shimoda Design Group to address the, the Mona building. And uh, in a moment, I, uh, upon uh, Alan Loomis's presentation, Joey will present to you the stage one and two design for, that, uh, for the building. And uh, the agency also retained the services of AECOM. And we have Va Mr. Von Davies, who will present the uh, proposed design for the passageway. At this point, I th unless you have specific questions about some of the housekeeping items, there are several items before you. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Loomis to refresh your memories about some of the guiding principles for that block, and then we'll proceed through the presentation. Will we have a graphic in the presentation? Yes, the I'm, unfortunately I wasn't allowed any graphics, so you have my pretty face to do the, the talking, purpose. and then they want to reserve the graphics for their purposes. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's our cue to, for the projector, <laughs> the graphics. Uh, I don't have much to add to what Emil has offered, other than I have a few uh, visuals to sort of describe everything that he said. Um, this image uh, is an old familiar friend at this point in Artifad. And you can see down at the uh, the lower right is the Central Park. This is a view sort of looking above the Americana down on the Art and Entertainment District in Maryland with Central Park on the right. Uh, there, uh, one of the key ideas of the Central Park Master Plan is this east-west connection that would align with Caruso Avenue, cross the park to connect with the Adult Recreation Center and the neighborhood beyond. And then a north-south connection, as Emil mentioned, that uh, could pass through the central reading room of the library uh, linking the Central Park, that East-West Passage with Maryland Avenue and the Art and Entertainment District. The Central Park Master Plan that was uh, adopted and directed in 2009 uh, really had four basic phases. The first phase was, the, in, in effect, the Adult Recreation Center, which at that time was complete. That's the one highlighted there in orange. The f next phase, which is the item you're considering uh, today, is the realignment and landscaping of the north-south alley behind properties on Brand Boulevard, as well as that the east-west passage from Brand to the alley. As Emil mentioned, the second phase is renovations and landscape work related to the central library. Emil mentioned that we, and the staff report mentions, that we are actually interviewing uh, consultants this coming, um, uh, this coming month, and we'll be back to you with a proposal a firm to recommend uh, later this year. And then finally, in another phase is the actual landscaping of the park itself. So just to remind you, these are the sort of upcoming phases that we are anticipating related to sort of bringing the Central Park entirely together and connecting it with the Art and Entertainment District and the Americana at Brand. Today, what you're considering is just this area highlighted in orange. The first piece will be the consideration of the building uh, on Brand Boulevard for the Museum of Neon Art. That will be Joey Shimoda's presentation. And the second half is all the landscape work surrounding it, which would be by Vaughn Davies from the firm AECOM. I want to note before I introduce these two architects that uh, I think we gave them something of a shotgun wedding, and they performed quite admirably and met many times to ensure the maximum degree of coordination between two separate projects. So with that, I'm finished, and we'll turn the mic presentation over to Joey to discuss the Museum of Neon Art proposed design. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members of the City Council. I'd like to start out by thanking all of you for giving us the opportunity to work with the City of Glendale, with all of you on the Council and the City Redevelopment Agency. The experience, even though it's been maybe a year and a half to two years, has actually been a really great one. Um, we are concentrating our project on the address of 212 and 216 Brand Boulevard, and it is a new civic building that we're proposing for the, um, the community. The ideas behind the building really are about a celebration of light and architecture and art. And so all the elements that we've included in the project always revolve around that element of light. But it's not only a, a civic building. The way we've designed it, we have uh, an ability for it to become a multi-use building. It can have many lifetimes in terms of being another cultural building or as a participant in, in the entertainment district. It can certainly become an office. It could become a restaurant. It could become regular retail. I'd like to point out three key features of the building, which um, the first is what we're calling the icon, 
which is a 19-foot uh, neon-lit sculpture called, called The Diver. We envision that uh, element to become a permanent piece on the building, and like the marquee on the Alex Theater, this will help anchor this block as a, as a major sort of cultural element. Um, the next item I want to talk about is what we call the lantern, which is a glass box that's floating out over the passageway and onto Brand Boulevard. The notion here is, is that um, this glass box is not, does not have a floor, but it'll always function as an image of art and of light in the community. The third element that I want to talk about is um, the large amount of storefront that we provided. Um, we want to make sure and encourage that the use of the building uh, during the day and during the evening is inviting and one that's adaptable to other types of uses. I'd like to go over with, with you a little bit about the master planning of the project because this is a renovation project and not a ground up project. So we have a little bit of uh, surgery to do to this existing building facade. This is how it currently exists um, except now the blue awnings are gone and the building has been painted. So as a graphic the building looks a little bit more like this. The first step we're going to do is remove a portion of the building, about 50 feet of it, to be able to create the passageway. The views that we're taking this from are from the Americana side. Now what you'll notice is we're able to create a new opportunity on this facade to have open uh, openings and participation into the passageway. The next step that we're going to do is we're going to remove the first 27 feet of the building in order to create a brand new image for the building. But what's not noticeable in this, this uh, image is that we're actually trying to retain about 70% of the existing structure so that we can concentrate all of our uh, resources into making the biggest impact to the public. This building is an aerial, pers this um, view is an aerial perspective of the project. And what I want to call your attention to here is how the lantern and also we've created a little box on um, the smaller building side that gives a variety to the Bram Boulevard um, uh, frontage, which makes it appear to be um, more than multiple, more like multiple buildings. But we also have the ability to create new storefront and frontage along the passageway. Um, the other element is a large operable door that we believe will be able to link the interior activities of the building with the passageway. And in this slide, um, best illustrates some of the signage variances we're asking for, the first one being for the large uh, neon sign, um, some additional signage on the street naming um, the tenant, um, the signage along the side, which currently we're showing a Manny Moe and Jack sign, but we're really talking about this whole area as becoming a rotating uh, opportunity for cultural signage. This is the typical floor plan of the building, and what I want to call your attention to on this slide is um, the fact that we have multiple access points along uh, Brand, the Paseo, as well as a large access point along and the, toward the rear of the Paseo. But as you can see, it's a very large floor plate that we can divide in many different ways and can accommodate um, a, a very a multitude of uses. The final slide I'd like to show you is how we hope at the final, uh, when, when it's all built, that we've created this, uh, this beautiful luminous building that becomes an anchor to the entertainment district to the south, but also becomes a beacon for this block. It becomes a signifier. Um, but most importantly, that it becomes the bridge that unifies all of the rich retail activity along Brand to the Glendale Library, to the Adult Recreation Center, and to the new uh, passageway. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Vaughn Davies of AACOM to tell you a little bit more about the passageway and the alley improvements. Thank you, Joey. Uh, thank you very much for having us join you this afternoon to walk through the alley, uh, the passageway. This is a really great opportunity for the building, as Joey's mentioned, to glow as a lantern at, at nighttime, but also to be a great part of the street life during the day. Uh, and encourage the Brand Avenue, the sidewalk paving in Brand Avenue to really uh, continue through the passageway and ultimately uh, to the alleyway beyond and uh, hopefully into the civic space of the uh, Central Park as well. We've divided the space into essentially two edges. There is the edge on the north side which will be occupied by spillover events and a cafe or exhibit space onto a wooden deck from the, uh, the gallery spaces uh, in this area and a very gracious uh, sl slow rising ramp on this side to provide ADA ac accessibility up through into the Central Park area, which will also have cafe space uh, available on the south side. 
and a very simple, uh, elegant wall on both sides that can accept uh, exhibits from uh, the Mona exhibits that are internal that might become external as well. And a very simple shaded area in the middle, uh, street, uh, street trees, again, that continue inside, so taking a lot of the elements from the sidewalk through the space, and then a central small uh, fountain that really provides a sense of respite and quiet uh, from the street space as you enter uh, this room. So really a room that is both for small functions, for informal uh, relaxing, but as well as events that might happen during the day and in the evening uh, for both the cafe and Mona themselves. This is a ground level view looking back from uh, the alleyway, uh, so moving towards the library. You see the exhibit space, the, the wood deck, uh, the small shadow uh, pool that we have as a reflecting pool to pick up the night light from the neon, which we think would be a wonderful reflective quality in this space as well. And then moving further back towards the, the library, this is a point in the alleyway where the alleyway crosses over uh, the passage. We want to extend the passage as far forward as we can into the garden space of the Central Park area, a great civic place, a place to drop people off for events at the library or ARC or in the Central Park itself if there are events that happen in the park. So it becomes a place of arrival. Uh, could be illuminated at night as well as a great civic space. The scale gets a little bit grander and more civic as you move through it. Very simple plan. We've tried to keep it, uh, not introduce too many new elements. This is a simple sidewalk paving from the Brand Boulevard that comes through, the wood deck that you see uh, as wood uh, adjacent to the Mona and on the fence here as well. Simple palm trees that pick up some of the palms that exist in Central Park as well. And the beginning of what you see is the alleyway, which has been tidied up uh, as part of the beginning of the Civic Center and Civic Central Park, eventually to wrap the entire Central Park, but a simple alley that could be for strolling or jogging, uh, adding a, a row of ex extra row of trees, taking out the double lanes of traffic that exists, or the separate lanes of traffic and parking, and combining it as one essentially a normal streetscape uh, with parking ag against the retail stores at the back and perpendicular parking for people who are using the ARC in the library and garden space at the north side. Um, you heard earlier a little bit about the land swap. If this is something that we're in agreement with, this is where the additional lane is required on Colorado to come through, and currently the property line extends out into that. The notion would be to uh, provide uh, air rights over the alleyway, over the parking, and sidewalk, as well as below grade, so that this parcel uh, on the corner could make up the space that is lost on, on Colorado, compensated both above grade and below grade in this area, and still keep the passageway and alleyway intact. Thank you. Before I turn it over to Kim uh, Koga, I forgot to mention in my portion of the presentation that there is a, a request for a sign variance before you, and that's specific to the Mona building, given that many of the signage that's proposed for the building are considered non-accessory per the zoning code, which means that they're not advertising the business inside. They're signage of a plumbing business or Manny Mo and Jack. As such, uh, uh, there is a variance request before you. At this point, if I may um, ask Kim Koga to present their uh, proposed community pro programming to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Najarian and Council Members. I'm Kim Koga. As the director of MONA since 1999 and an artist working in NEON, I'm really pleased to be here today to encourage your support for the MONA project in Glendale. This year, 2011, marks our 30th year as a museum, having curated and installed over 200 exhibits of art, signs and photography, all relating to neon, electricity, and kinetics. For three decades, Mona has contributed to the arts and culture of the Los Angeles area, creating an awareness and an appreciation for its rich legacy of neon signs and educating and entertaining the public with our unique art form. We look forward to the opportunity to create new and expand existing programming specifically for the city of Glendale. Examples of such programming would include self-guided tours of historic Glendale Neon, past and present. In addition to showing the history of Glendale through its signage, the tour would acquaint a new audience to the city and businesses that make up the city itself. Tri-City tours would include the larger Glendale Burbank and North Hollywood areas. The continuation of our jazz-inspired First Friday music series, but with expanded dates during the month, so a First Friday and Beyond series to include other types of music as well. Participation in the 
citywide open studio art tours, an annual film series to be screened at the Alex Theater with a focus on the use of neon in film, a mobile neon classroom that can be brought to schools that would include demonstrations and explanations of what neon is and how it works. This could be a supplement to the science and art curriculum. And finally, Lumens on Brand, a program of creating historic illuminated signs or identifying an existing uh, or identifying existing signs and helping to refurbish them, and a display of our automobile-related neon signs and neon art in the median or inside one of the auto dealerships on Brand Boulevard of Cars. With your support, we look forward to making these and other programs a reality in Glendale. Thanks. Uh, is there someone who wanted to follow uh, Catherine or Kathy Foley? And uh, David Svensson. I'm uh, Kathy Foley Meyer, and I'm the Mona board member who's probably been most closely involved with this process from the beginning. Um, I was actually with Kim when we made our first presentation to the city, um, and at that meeting, uh, with the redevelopment agency, everyone became so excited that we actually jumped into a van driven by Jim Starbird, and we went down and we looked at the property on the same day. And, um, and then we came back about a month later, and I presented a slate of programs. Um, I'd like to thank the city council, first off, for this opportunity and the redevelopment agency, and also say that it's been a real pleasure working with uh, Mark Berry and Emil and Phil and Jillian and everyone at the agency. Um, I'm a graphic designer and an artist, and Mona has actually been an integral part of my development as an artist. Uh, Kim and I have looked at a lot of buildings together, everything from uh, warehouses in the toy district to basement space in the jewelry district. I even looked at an empty Greyhound bus depot on my own in Pasadena. But as we began to look at buildings, I realized that we need more than a building. You know, we actually need a community that welcomes us and can really appreciate what Mona has to offer. So, and we really believe that we found that with Glendale. So, just wanted to say thank you very much. David Svensson. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council members, it's, uh, I am a board member, neon artist. I was here last year speaking to you, introducing Mona. Um, our, our group has done a great uh, presentation to you. I, I, I come to Mona as a neon artist and a, an educator in neon. I've been uh, teaching neon at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco for 11 years. I just see how students of all ages uh, just really become alive with this medium. Uh, we, we've sort of been emphasizing the historical signage uh, that we have in our collection and you guys have in your community. Uh, but neon is this natural material that is just fantastic to uh, uh, expose children, uh, young adults, to uh, physics, electronics, and chemistry. And I just see how that can help in uh, in educating our youth and and um, I just want to thank all of you for uh, getting this far with uh, with Mona and I, I in over the year I've uh, learned to uh, uh, appreciate your community I, I'm impressed by the the cleanliness and efficiency with uh, retail dealers uh, on Brand Avenue and so forth. Uh, my wife is Japanese and from Japan uh, where things are kept quite tidy and pride in their culture. I just see that happening here in Glendale and she was very impressed by this as well. So I, I just want to thank all of you for, uh, for uh, uh, this opportunity for Mona and for Glendale. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Marty, these are for this side. Yes. Matt Johnson. Roy Foyer. Good afternoon, members of the council and the agency. My name is Annette Johnson. I'm also a Mona board member for about the past four years. Um, 
and uh, I also want to thank you and commend you for your vision and for including Mona in that vision. Um, I actually lived in Glendale in the early 80s, and um, at that time, my father-in-law was working on the doctor's house, which is in Brand Park, and I saw that restoration go through, and you have that beautiful amenity there, and um, it just shows the long history that you have of this public-private partnership, and um, it's really what it takes for something uh, like Mona to have a permanent home in a community working together. And I, I just think it's really great, and I'm excited to see it all come to fruition. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm up here today. My name is Joy Foyer. Hello, Laura. <laughs> Um, and I am a resident of Glendale, I'm an artist in Glendale, and I also have a nonprofit organization um, that many of you are familiar with called Art from the Ashes. And I am a lover of the Museum of Neon Art from ways back, and I had the unique opportunity to actually get to know them and the space that we're all talking about today um, up close and personal over the last year when we hosted two different exhibitions for Art from the Ashes in June and once again in November thanks to a very art-supportive city. You know who you are. Um, and I just have to say, the one thing that was really amazing um, for the you know 12 weeks or so that we were in there, people would come in, and, and not only were they desperately seeking a destination for art, they were excited at the notion that um, a community space could, could be um, in the works. And I got the you know, fortitude to talk about the Museum of Neon Art. There was neon in the windows, even though that was not our exhibition. Um, you know, we're all connected, and so of course I took the opportunity to educate people what was happening in Glendale and, and the support and, and the vision. And I have to tell you that as an artist as well, and, and somebody who loves to travel around and always investigate unique um, art, um, the one thing that I think is tremendous about Glendale is having such a unique museum here. You can't go to any city and have a museum of neon art. So it's not only going to be great for the community that's here, it's going to be great for people that travel here and it's going to offer something new and different and unique and I think make a statement about how we feel about the arts, which um, makes me feel incredibly joyful. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards on this item, so I will close the public hearing. Go to comments. I have some questions. I have some questions, um, some for staff. I'll do those first and then some for the designer. <laughs> My first question is that um, we are renovating the building, and then there's an additional allowance up to a million dollars to undertake tenant interior improvements. So I'm wondering what the difference is in terms of our renovation and then why they need a million dollars to do more renovations. Oh, yes, agency chair Friedman, that's an um, excellent question given that based on the ground lease agreement, we, uh, the agency is obligated to bring the building to a, a standard to be occupied potentially by any future tenant, in this case it's Mona. Those uh, improvements uh, include uh, improvements to the structural system, upgrades to the basically revamping the entire HVAC system and installing new electrical and uh, plumbing uh, systems. The additional $1 million is an allowance for uh, interior improvements that are specific to Mona, separate from the improvements that we are providing uh, to the building. Uh, we are very cognizant that the improvements that are being um, done to the specific building potentially have a longer life that should uh, Mona's future change, that building could potentially be occupiable by other uh, retail or commercial tenants. You're saying that the money, that, that million dollar allowance, that money would be, that, that's invested in the property could be of use to future tenants if Mona was to leave? No, that million dollars is specific to Mona for their tenant improvements prior to their occupying the space. Okay. The improvements to the course, shell of the building have a longer life. I was just trying to understand the difference between the renovations that we were doing and then what they needed for their improvements. 
and why there were sort of two different budget items for that. Maybe, maybe I can address that for you. Typically how we're approaching the project and the different budget allotments is, is if you were, for say, a developer, you would provide a certain amount of infrastructure to a tenant, then the tenant would take that from a certain point and then finish out. In this specific case, some very simple examples would be HVAC. We would, in the base budget for development of the building, would put the unit on top of the building but we pr provide no distribution through the building or controls. So part of Mona's cost for that would be to pay for the distribution and controls on the interior. Another example would be the restrooms. We would provide uh, plumbing up to a certain point and a stub out into the floor, but Mona's budget would be responsible for putting in a toilet, putting in a fixture, putting in the room itself. And so um, the, the, the difference between the allotments are that if you could imagine a completely empty shell that the city is providing, and then Mona's budget allows them to continue to fit out the shell. So if, so if I can add to say that the improvements that the million dollar allowance would be paying for would not be usable by a subsequent tenant, that may not be the case. They may actually be very usable by a subsequent That's tenant. True. It's just that they happen to be the kinds of interior improvements that if this were a pure private individual to private business uh, transaction that the tenant would normally be responsible for. In this case, we're providing some additional assistance, but very likely restroom improvements, distribution of HVAC, given the open nature of the building, many of those improvements would be usable by a subsequent tenant. Okay, thank you. That that's, makes it a lot clearer to me. And then I have a couple of questions for the landscape architect. And I'm sorry if these seem a little nitpicky. Very happy to help. And to reopen the public hearing. Um, my, and I, again, I'm sorry if these seem nitpicky, but I just want to be clear about a few things. Um, the cypress trees that you have, the potted cypress, don't those only get about five feet tall? No, they, they, there are species that grow much taller than that, so these would be fairly iconic trees that would probably grow to about 30 feet ultimately. Okay, that's great. I just wanted to be sure. Um, the feather grass you have, isn't that a pretty invasive species of plant? No, in the situation it's going to be in, it's going to be very controlled. There's, we're not in an open field where we're going to be having the grasses blowing all over the place. So, But it's, doesn't it spread by seed, that blow around? It does, but we have mostly, other than the specific areas they're planted in, there's going to be hardscape in most of the other areas. So you could guarantee us that it's not going to blow into the park behind it and become a problem for our maintenance crews? No, we can't guarantee that it's going to... Okay, so no. I would make a suggestion that maybe you find something that has no chance of becoming a maintenance issue for us later on with the park. Fair enough. Um, and then my last question, you'll be glad to hear, is about the palm trees. And, you know, just watching what we had to deal with with the winds and watching, as I do every year, as workers climb up 60 feet to try to trim palm trees, I just wonder if this is something that's going to cost us a lot more to maintain than other types of trees, because I think palm trees do when they get large. And secondly, and more importantly, I was just wondering if, given that it's a large area that we're hoping to have a lot of gatherings in, whether having trees that provide some shade would be more practical and comfortable for the people that are there. I'll start with the shade. I think in the, uh, in the passageway itself, we do have shade trees. We're providing shade trees outside the gathering space for the for well, I understand Mona. that, but in the area where you have the palm trees. And in the area where we have the palm trees, really, is a, it's, a, it's a very heavily trafficked area, so we want to maintain some visibility for vehicles and people getting in and out of cars as well. We also want to create a sort of an iconic view in the landscape that when you're at Brand Avenue and looking across the street, you get the sense of these trees being illuminated at night. There's a certain statuesqueness about them as they enter the other space. Um, I think the, uh, all trees and all landscape requires maintenance. There is no such thing in our minds as, tree, as, an, as a maintenance-free tree. And I think we, uh, we tend to overlook maybe all the maintenance that goes into making other trees really uh, excel and grow to their full sort of, sort of pride. So I don't think that the palm trees necessarily, if they're maintained well, are going to become a hazard or anything more dangerous than any other tree, more of a hazard. Okay, maybe at some point, I know Steve Zern's not here, but just want to be um, uh, sort of um, convinced by him that what we pay to maintain the palm trees that are around the city are not significantly more expensive. Not, not being a plant trees. person, it probably depends on their ultimate oh. height. I presume we're using, Mr. Ahern, Dave may have some comments, I presume we're using uh, a palm that isn't going to grow to be the, the height that we see on some of the old city streets, but some that can be reached by a bucket 
in which case they may be maintained through our normal street tree program. Dave, you have any thoughts on it? Um, uh, members of Council, Mr. Starbird, the trees that are proposed are quite large, um, and with all the maintenance in this passageway, it's beyond what we normally maintain. We'll, the parks section uh, will be maintaining the passageway along with the ARC park. So it, the entire area is a larger maintenance uh, program than we normally um, address in our parks. What we'll be doing and what we spoke with agency staff about in reviewing these plans is identifying a cost for maintenance of the overall site, including these trees. Um, and then we would probably contract that out with one of the firms that we use for trimming trees, Mariposa or uh, one of the other firms. And um, it just depends on the frequency of maintenance for those trees. Because we do it on a citywide basis, we get a very competitive price. Um, so it's it's in our normal um, range of cost um, based on you know fifteen to fifteen hundred to two thousand trees you get a little better price. Okay. Sure. Yeah, these are the trees that get really big. <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, my last question is probably for staff, and I'm not sure who it's for. Um, but um, just in terms of the fountain, we do have fountains around the city that are dry. Not right now because it's been raining, but when we're in a drought situation that have to be drained, including the one in Perkins Plaza. And I'm wondering if this fountain is using reclaimed water or is recirculating or how we're going to deal with that. And if we are in a drought situation again in a few years, is this going to be dry? I actually would like to defer to Mr. Davies to answer that question because it's a very interestingly designed fountain. Thank you. Um, we have been very cognizant about water and, and uh, using as little water as we can. So we've really designed the fountain so that it can be a very elegant fountain, even if the water is not in it, and it provides a reflective surface with the tile work. It's only really about an inch thick, uh, inch deep of water that's really flowing and recycling throughout the pond and back into this space. So if, if, ne if we need to be in a drought situation uh, and, and empty the pond, we think it's still going to be a very elegant reflective surface that will catch the light from the neon in the evening, which is really the purpose, of, one of the purposes of it, and the other is to provide a little bit of uh, water, white noise essentially from the traffic and the vehicles that might be uh, trapped in the alleyway. So we're cognizant of the fact that it needs to be dry, and if, it, and if there are times when it is dry, it will still be an elegant feature, sculptural feature within the space. Thank you very much. While we're talking about design features, the, um, from the pictures it looks like the flooring is that a wood flooring yes we're like wanting to do a, on the one side there's a wood deck um, and it's very similar to what's at the Americana brand if you walk around where the trolley goes at the Americana we're trying to use some of the palette of materials that's recently been introduced in downtown and it's something we've used on other projects they're very hard very durable woods and provides more of a uh, familial space rather than a, a hard uh, urban space outside, just outside of the, the museum space, so it'd be more of a party space or event space. Trees are going to be coming up through the flooring? No, they will be in a separate planting bed that is uh, carved out from that space adjacent to the benches. Mr. Fainer? Um, are we still in an open hearing or? It's an open hearing, but Still open. pending any. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Yeah, of staff. Why don't, why don't we do that then? The source of the funding? Million dollars? <laughs> uh, agency funds at this point. Redevelopment funds. Redevelopment funds. That's. That money is. Uh, this is considered high priority for the use of the monies other than other projects in the redevelopment zone? Oh, that is a good question. I'd like to defer to... Uh... The question, Mr. Weaver. Is this the highest priority of the use of redevelopment funds at this time in the city? Putting a million dollars aside for this, what else is on the platter? I'm, I don't have the budget in front of me. We, we have this programmed in with all of our other costs and expenses programs, uh, directions that you have given us. Uh, the funding for the project, and when I say the project, both the museum uh, and the uh, alleyway and pass-through, a portion of that is bond-funded. Uh, a great portion of that of the alley and, and passageway, all of it is bond-funded. 
uh, specifically for for that project. Um, with respect to some of the other agency projects, uh, this is something that we have brought to you and feel that uh, it, it is their, your direction that this be the southern anchor. Uh, as using art as an economic development tool, we think it is important uh, in the revitalization uh, or the vitalization of downtown. So the million dollars of tenant improvements are bonded money? No, those are tax increment agency dollars. Which could be used for other projects, but this is considered the highest priority at this time. We we have funding for the other projects that have been proposed, uh, so it well, is. You know, the state is up there talking about taking redevelopment dollars, so I'm trying to figure doing with what we have. Can I, can I try and can I try and respond to that? Um, your staff's view has been that Mona is a very high priority. If we were looking at what may be the end of funding of redevelopment, this is an area where we would this this is an area where we would recommend you invest some of your last dollars, frankly, because we think it'll pay tremendous dividends to the city. Uh, certainly, in terms of as Phil mentioned, sort of beginning to build this foundation of art and culture in the community, something I think the community and many people have asked for for many many years. And secondly, in terms of act, potentially having the spin-off benefit of active, helping us activate the downtown, as well as bringing in a companion use for this passageway, then instead of having a very, pardon the phrase, passive passageway that really doesn't serve as a magnet except it just becomes a place to go from one area to another, this is a tremendous opportunity to activate that space. Uh, we've had lots of conversations with the Caruso company over the years, and he's been very concerned about the other side of brand. I'll tell you, looking at the architect's renderings of what this could look like at night and the activity level that we could see during the day, uh, I sent Phil an email saying, we need to send Mr. Caruso the architect's renderings of what this could look like when it's all done, because I think it will do a tremendous job of activating what has been uh, a, a rather dead area of South Brand on that side of the street for a long, long time. Uh, yes, redevelopment is under threat. We could find ourselves by the end of this week or next week uh, with the state uh, trying to end our redevelopment activities. My recommendation would be I think this is a very wise investment for what may be some of the last uh, income the redevelopment agency could have if the governor is successful. One more question to the staff. Oh, well, well, a question, because I'll close the public hearing and we can get comments. Yeah, it's comments. Right okay, I'll close the public hearing. Now I'll go to Mr. Drain. All right, well, <clears throat> it's not a surprise that I support this project, I guess. Um, it's, it's, if so, it's the most well-publicized uh, secret, I guess. Um, I'm very happy that uh, we've been able to uh, uh, work with the board at Mona and to bring this project to our downtown. Uh, some of the issues have been touched on just now by the city manager and also by Mr. Lance Ben and others. Um, and I'm glad that the issue of priority was brought up. Where does this fit in our list of priorities? In the first place, in the time I've been here anyway, which I admit is rather short, just one term, but I will tell you that in my time here, we have not sat down as an agency and said we prioritize our projects one, two, three, four, five, and six, uh, that this project is more important than that project and that project is more important than the next. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, uh, a city is not a business, and though some say, you know, we should run a city like a business, uh, the arts are exceedingly important to this city and to any city. We have, been, we have been without in this city from a city promoted standpoint uh, from our founding as a city to the present. Uh, I shouldn't say to the present, but within the last two, two, with the exception of the last couple of years, let's put it that way. If this city can be said to have a tradition with regard to the arts, it's that we have no tradition in the arts. Um, we have never made it a priority. It has always been a luxury item. And I think in the last few years we've been able to show that art as an economic development tool is very effective and very important. So much so that our retail development uh, partners 
see it also and have supported this. And um, the um, uh, said before, we the city of Glendale may may never see a museum where we see the great masters on the wall. We may never see the great French Impressionists in our museums in Glendale. But I think we have an opportunity in bringing Mona to the city in um, being able to leap bounds ahead of our, uh, our neighbors in the region in terms of modern art, uh, industrial art, and, and, the, uh, and so on. Mona is not just a gallery either. Mona is also a very substantial collection of historic neon. And it isn't just about Manny, Moe, and Jack on the outside. It's about iconic landmarks and images from throughout Southland and, in fact, throughout the country. Uh, this space is adaptable. This space, whether it is Mona or uh, retail or another exhibit space, uh, will activate this passageway. And what were we going to have prior to that? We were going to have a 100-foot wide um, opening between Brand Boulevard uh, and uh, and the park. I, I I know we all say in our presentation this is going to be a paseo that will take us back to the adult recreation center. I'm just wondering how much activity the adult recreation center is going to bring a hundred foot wide paseo. I'm just trying to picture the flow of uh, of uh, retail traffic out of the Americana across the street and off to the adult recreation center. That. That isn't the purpose of that paseo, or if it is, then I missed something here as a Glendale resident. We need to activate that passageway, and this is the way to do it. Um, now, I want to add one other, one or two other things, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think the design is fantastic, and I think that the architects are to be commended. Uh, cost money, yes. And if we're ever going to invest in the arts in our downtown, we're going to have to spend some money. Um, if we're ever going to put our mouths where our money is or our money where our mouths are, uh, this is the time to do it. And it is literally, possibly, the last time that we can do it. Um, lastly, I want to, it's a strange tangent, I want to just um, share with my colleagues and to a smaller extent the public. Um, that this project actually grew out of an ICSC conference. So there's something to be said for going to uh, the, uh, the Las Vegas conference. It was uh, 2007 and my uh, first trip to ICSC. And uh, wanting to see more than just retail centers and meet with developers and uh, see what the latest franchise restaurants were going to be and, and so on. And saw a notice uh, in Las Vegas about their uh, outdoor neon museum and took a walk over there to see what it was. And uh, it, at that time, it was just an interesting concept for moving people from one location to another via a, a neon corridor, although theirs is not specifically neon, it, although they bill it that way. Um, and after uh, after the uh, conference was over, I remember sitting uh, on the dais uh, waiting to start one of our meetings and we were chatting about it here and the possibilities that that would have for Glendale and then uh, discovering that there was a neon museum in the LA, greater LA area and seeing that on their website they were looking for a permanent home and trying to make contact and finding out nope, they seem no longer to be looking for a, a permanent home. And, um, and then I believe it was through Jay, um, or Hassan, Jay Platt, yeah, uh, that a contact was made with, uh, with Mona and um, then began the process of acquainting them with us and vice versa. Um, Glendale has a lot of galleries, private galleries, private art projects, programs. We have a terrific arts community in Glendale. It is diverse and dynamic and large in number. It's just it's fantastic. But what's missing is some representation that Glendale as a city wants to invest itself in the arts. That Glendale as a city says that the arts are emblematic of what's in the heart and soul of this city. And the fact that we can bring that forward 
in a way that also stimulates uh, the economy of the downtown and helps to, to continue to make Glendale a destination is fantastic, and I think it's a big part of what uh, our redevelopment direction is and should be. Uh, I think it will be a terrific southern anchor for the uh, Art and Entertainment District. I support it and thank the staff for working so diligently on this. And I know it was not an easy project to get on, but it's different. It's something we haven't done before. Uh, so I'm happy it will be our first downtown museum. Uh, hopefully not our last. Thank you all. Yeah. The one, I love the, the design. I think it's great. That swimmer keeps reminding me of Esther Williams. I don't know why. <laughs> that's that's the only thing I can think of from the time I saw it the first time. And I like the passageway design. That's that's the one side of what I have to do. Um, I used to belong to the Glendale Arts uh, community in Glendale, the oldest in the state of California. We could not get any traction in this city at all the arts for display or anything. Nobody wanted to have us have anything to do with the Glendale Arts Association. Yes, there are a lot of artists, a lot of Hollywood people that live in this city. They're there. I just have a different approach. I said it during my campaigning that I have to um, consider to be fiscally responsible and act the way I believe. Um, we have the passageway, I call it right now, a passageway to nowhere. I've tried to advocate for an underground parking where Central Park is. De Pietro's property is going to need parking. Fill up. That all goes hand in hand in putting a parking structure underground, public parking and private parking combined. And then with the development in the Central Park area, you can develop develop it so that people that are using the Americana, which I use every week, will want to cross a busy six-lane Grand Boulevard with high-speeding traffic to go more than just the museum. We're not there yet. I've advocated the passageway, which is great, being simply put in grass to save money for now until we develop out the rest. We have to get rid of the parking, that alley. That's all got to come out someday. That's the future until we have funds to do it. We, I remember great length the discuss of this uh, chess park. Oh, what it was going to do for Glendale. It, was, it got awards, everything. And it's empty every single time I go through there, except for some homeless people sitting there eating or sleeping. So, now I'm to think that people are going to cross six lanes of brand to go over and visit the museum on a weekly basis or whatever, because they're sure not going to go buy that into an alley. It doesn't make sense. Main problem I have at this time, for over a year I've been very consistent. I want to discuss this in closed session. I want to see the books on Mona. To this day, staff has never provided that to me and as a councilman I had a right to expect it and here it is the first time in the public and I'm asked to vote for something when I didn't get what I asked for many many times uh, one was getting at least free for two years we're putting a million dollars improvement into it at the end of five, 15 years uh, 690,000 to the city you know, I, I need to know that we're bringing in a viable company that can be in business, but can they pay the rent, whatever? Numbers have changed from the times I've seen it in closed session on what the rents are going to be. Maybe I just forgot the latest decision on how the rents will be structured over 15 years. While I love the design, I'm willing to vote for that because I know if something happens with Mona, the property can be reused. Great design. And I know the parkway, parkway will be great when we have something at the other end to go to. But 
I have to be consistent with what I've said well over a year in closed session. I see the books. I never have. Now, if staff can show me how I can vote on here on these different motions to make sure the building is built, rehabbed, done, I'll do that. Otherwise, I will vote no on every single one of these. You can tell me what I can vote for to rehab the building. I'd be glad to do that. I'm going to let you go review those and go to uh, Friedman, and then maybe you can clear up exactly because it's a series of eight or so motions and resolutions that you. Would you like me to do that now? Uh, why don't you hold off and of let's go to Ms. Friedman and then sure. we'll get your answer. Thank you. Um, uh, I am going to be supporting this today. Um, I think that Mr. Weaver raises a lot of very valid concerns. Um, I share some of his concerns, um, but I look at it like this. First of all, we have to remember that this is not general fund money. This is redevelopment money. And what is redevelopment supposed to be for? It's supposed to be for economic development and mostly reducing, re, removing blight, but also economic development. And I know in the city that we've come to think of our redevelopment agency and of redevelopment as being basically supporting retail. That's been our economic development strategy for many, many years. Building the exchange, building the marketplace, investing in the Americana, and all of that's great. But I don't believe that that's a complete, that gives you a complete strategy for economic development. If you think about it, most people do not drive out of their city to go shopping just for the stores. They go there for other reasons as well. I mean, to be really crass about it, it's, it's things that we used to call tourist attractions. And really what this is, if you put aside the art part, if, if you're somebody who just doesn't buy that, who thinks more about the dollars and what we get in the investment for this, we're providing a tourist attraction that hopefully will bring people from other cities into our shopping district to shop, to eat in the restaurants, to do all of those things, but to have sort of a complete experience and a complete day with their family. And that's what we lack right now in the downtown. So I do think that it's something that's fair to be used under redevelopment. I think it is within that purview. And I do believe that the arts are an essential component of economic vitality for a city. I know people that go to Pasadena quite often from Glendale. They have the same stores here. You know, we can go to Banana Republic in Old Town, or you can go to Banana Republic at the Galleria, but what they get in, in Pasadena a lot of times is that more complete artistic experience or cultural experience of being able to go to the Norton Simon Museum, to be able to go to the Lemley, which hopefully we'll have here, and do all of those things that are beyond just shopping. So this provides that. And to me, there's sort of two different things, and Mr. Weaver was getting at that. There's two different components to this. One component is investing in our infrastructure here in the city in terms of a building that the agency owns, which is an old dilapidated building that really needs to be renovated if it's going to be good for anything, good for the agency, good for the city. This project does that. It gives us a building that is a very nice design that retains a lot of the building. It's not a huge investment, but it, it kind of gives it a facelift, rehabs it enough to where Mona can move in. And if, if for whatever, and I hope this doesn't happen, but if Mona doesn't last there, we have an asset that we can really do something with, which we can't do with the building as it exists now. We can rent it out. It can become retail. It can become a civic gallery. It can become many things, but it's something that's worth investing in because otherwise it's just a stagnant piece of property that's, uh, that, that we own that we're not getting a return on our investment in. It's vacant now. Um, the passageway, um, I do believe that when the library renovation is complete, and given that I believe that the libraries in the future are going to fulfill an even more important function in this community and in all communities than they do now, I think that passageway could become very important. So I agree. People are not going to be parading across the street to go from the Americana to the Adult Recreation Center necessarily, but it's not, that's not the only thing that's there. We also have a park, a nice-sized park, and we have a library which for people with children, people who want to have a day downtown with their family, could become very important. So it's, it's kind of that development of an entire civic space, an entire space downtown that gives you that complete experience. <coughs> Education in the library or civic space, community space in the park, retail across the street, and an artistic <coughs> space in Mona that gives us a much more uh, cohesive and complete downtown. 
And I believe that all of that is a very fair um, way to invest redevelopment dollars. Now, I do agree with Mr. Weaver that we maybe need to get a more complete financial picture of Mona before investing that million dollars, but I think that there's a way of today moving forward with the project, with the renovations and all of that, and making that additional allowance, million dollar allowance, contingent on having the council and the agencies questions about Mona's ability to be a viable tenant answered as that project moves forward. I would support doing that if that makes Mr. Weaver feel more comfortable, and I know it would make me feel more comfortable as well. Um, because Mona at some point does have to pay rent, and you know it would be good to be, if we're going to make that investment in their space in terms of that million dollars, I think it's reasonable to expect that we can see some sort of indication. And I know that we've had some from the staff, but maybe seeing something that's more complete would make everybody feel more comfortable, and I, I would support that. Uh, and lastly, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Draymond for bringing this forward. It's sort of that big idea that um, is difficult to bring forward because it's easy to take pot shots at the big ideas, but they're the ones that I think tend to pay off the best in the long run. So I think this is a really exciting project. It is the potential to really change our downtown, to bring something to Glendale that we've never had before, and to really add to the economic vitality of our city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, let me go to uh, our city attorney, and I guess the question is, you want to vote for the, well, you heard Mr. Weaver, so why don't you explain it and perhaps. Uh, I did, um, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, city council and agency. The uh, non-lease related items would be at uh, two C and D. C is the motion approving stage one and two design review, that would be for the building. And C is a sign variance specifically related to this which, use, which although one? it is to this use. What? D is a sign variance. Okay, yeah. C and and C, I'm sorry, my voice is a little rough. C is exactly the design. <coughs> Question. On the other ones that are the least related, um, um, or, um, what are they? Or, no, no, or, resolutions, resolutions and motions. Um, on those, rather than having an up or down vote, would Mr. Weaver be satisfied with conditioning those um, so that, you know, if we are as a group satisfied as to the financial stability of Mona, that they would then move forward? I wanted to be back here. So that would be a continuance. Or a continuance? On, on those. Okay. I want to sit back here if you're trying to get me to buy in. And mine. I, I would just, in case it hasn't been already drawn to the agency's attention, uh, draw the agency's attention to the 33433 report, Kaiser Marston's memorandum uh, to, uh, which is analysis of the fair reuse value of the site um, and on his ability to pay either fair market uh, rental value or fair reuse to fair lease value something less than would be the fair lease value uh, for the site uh, as part of that analysis Kaiser Marston and Associates on uh, page two of that report um, exhibit two uh, was provided with Mona's audited financial statements from their previous year's operations and reviewed projections of those operations uh, at the Glendale location. And uh, based on that, um, had determined that they would, uh, plus with their programming uh, associated with the <coughs> facility, uh, determined that uh, it was um, uh, their ability both to pay the, the, the structure of, as set forth in the lease, which would be some lease abatement during the uh, initial years, starting at $2,500 per month and uh, ramping up to $5,000 a month in year six, and that in order to um, bring the site to, into a usable form, that uh, some expenditure would be necessary, as would be normal with a landlord and tenant uh, to provide accommodations in the site. So uh, another point related to the million dollars, I think that uh, uh, I didn't hear Emil mention specifically, is this is up to $1 million. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that they will be spending that full million dollars. It is certainly possible that those required upgrades that were identified by uh, the project architect would be somewhat less, <coughs> less than that. And I, I know both uh, uh, Mark Berry and, and Emil could elaborate further, but I did want to bring that to the agency. Do we get to, does anybody, does the agency or do the staff review and approve 
those, um, how that allowance is spent? Um, I believe the ground lease requires them to present. Um, they are currently working on uh, drafting this, uh, basically the TI plan, the tenant improvement plans, which would give the, the museum a better understanding of, what, uh, of their cost impacts. At some point, the lease requires them to present those for uh, agency review at the staff level, not necessarily at a public presentation, but at a staff level prior to the issuance of the up to a million dollar allowance. So if the preference is that as much of the money as possible is spent on upgrades that would kind of live with the building for a while, right. we would have some right. way of, of sort of prioritizing those. And again, the priority would be to um, um, structurally and system, improve the systems of the building first to the extent that's possible that has a more of an adaptable and flexible reuse versus uh, improvements that are specific to the, to the museum's uh, purposes. Okay, so Ms. Van Mine, you're, I guess, pointing to the conclusion of page three where it says that based on the projections, uh, Mono should be able to afford to pay the 357000 in rent through the first 10 years. Mr. Mayor, if I can, I, I'm glad Jillian brought that up because I was going to also respond if she hadn't. Let me, if I can, let me just read that brief paragraph in uh, Kaiser Marston's analysis because you recall we took some extra care and time to assist Mona in developing the projections to respond to Mr. Weaver's concerns. So let me, let me make a note of, of the Kaiser Marston again. KMA, which is Kaiser Marston, has reviewed Mona audited financial statements for previous year's operations and Kaiser Marston reviewed projections of Mona operations at a Glendale location. The operating projections take into account the obligations contained in the lease. The operating projections provided by Mona were consistent with their actual operations in previous years, so we made sure they weren't somehow overextending themselves in future years. Based on previous preliminary analysis that was prepared by KMA, the, operation, the operating projections appear achievable. The KMA projection of operating revenues and expenses are shown in Table 1. This table projects operating revenues and expenses over the initial 15-year term of the lease. The revenues from the special events, cruises, and classes that are obligations of the lease are shown in those respective revenue lines. Class revenue is projected to be $12,000 a year, and they go into some of the numbers. These expenses for these activities were not separately set out in the operating statements. So their conclusion is that, indeed, they believe, based on the, both their historical uh, operations and the reasonable projections in the future, that they will be able to uh, meet the operating obligations under the lease uh, based on their audit financial statements and their projections. So, Ms. Weaver, I apologize if we I, we, I think we thought we were getting there with what you wanted by without having you or me look at their actual financial statements, have KMA analyze them and do the projections and give us their assessment of whether or not they would be able to uh, meet their obligations on that the That should lease. have been provided to me a long time before now. I've asked for over a year. I'm looking in, in here in the same letter you're talking about. This is here, their operating surplus projected at $10,000 year one. Up to 79,000. These projections do not include any allowance for rent or for operating and capital reserves. Even in the Alex Theater, we're looking for them to build up the reserves, which they're doing. Uh, AMA believes that a prudent nonprofit would target a minimum of 3%, perhaps as much as 5% of total revenues as a reserve for capital uh, replacement and operating deficits. Now they can go on the conclusion. If I'd had this a month ago, I could have sat with staff, had all my questions answered, and got comfortable. Fortunately, it gets dumped on me over the weekend, and I haven't got the answers. So you have four votes. Mr. Contero has been fully in support of this in closed session. You got the four votes. So why not cut to the chase and, and vote? I'll vote for these two here that uh, do the uh, structural improvements. I might point out, as I understand, all of the actions today, whether city or agency, votes. require a maximum of three votes. That's right. I think there was some feeling originally that, that some of these actions may require four. And there was some reference in the staff report at one point to four votes being required, but I think and they're all three votes. Just so the public knows, if it had yeah. required four votes, I was going to vote for it today. Because Mr. Contero's gone, and I knew he supported it. I was on a four to one loss. So I was going to support it because of that. Now told it's three, then I can express what I truly believe at this point in time. And I hope it's very successful. 
I really do. Well, is there an opportunity for Mr. Weaver to sit down with staff and ask those questions if this has Certainly. continued a week? Certainly. I can, after fact, but the vote will be today. Like I said, I'll support uh, C and D. We, with the, with the threat would. of the state, we are trying to proceed and get, get these actions in place, uh, and the state is continuing to lay their actions in the budget. So time is of the essence, but we're more than happy to stand with Mr. Weaver and see if we can uh, provide him with some comfort, irrespective of the vote here today. Show me the books. Okay. Do you want a motion, Mr. Mayor? Well, anything? Wait, just. just. Um, I, I, I'm going to move the item. Let's see where it goes. Good. Good. Um, do I understand from the housekeeping information that two A, C, B, e, F, and H are can be taken together? Or I mean, they're all agency items. Yes. But can they all be taken together? Yes, they're uh, and, agency and resolutions and, and motions. That would be two A, C, D, F, and H. And then correct. B, E, and G are council items, resolutions. Correct. All three of those be taken. Care. Yes, they may. And um, I'm going to move for the agency items uh, 2A, C, D, F, and H. I ask these be taken one at a time. Oh, well, that's what I was just asking. Well, A, C, it D, can, and E. Yeah, it can, it can be, You would like them separately. Yeah, okay. Them. All right. Then uh, let, me, uh, let me move item 2A for the agency. Give a second. Oh, this is for the agents. Yeah. I'll second. Roll call, please. Agency members Draymond? Yes. Jarman? Yes. Quintero? Weaver? No. Chair Friedman? Yes. Okay. Um, item uh, 2C for the agent. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Agency members Draymond? Yes. Jarman? Yes. Quintero? Weaver? Aye. Chair Friedman? Yes. Item 2 I'm trying to read my own notes. E, e for the agency. Second. Roll call, please. Agency members Draymond? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Carol? Weaver? Aye. Chair Frieden? Yes. Item 2F for the agency. Second. Agency members Draymond? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Carol? Weaver? No. Chair Frieden? Yes. Lastly, item 2H. To agency resolution. Second. Agency members Draymond? Yes. Darian? Yes. Arrow? Weaver? No. Chair Friedman? Yes. So we have for council then uh, e, e, B, E, and G. B, e, e, and G. Someone move those? Yes. And is there a desire that they be taken separately? No, we, C and D have already been voted. Those are the two that do the Structural improvements. B, E, and G. All right, then, then uh, items 2B, E, and G for the council. Second. Roll call, please. Council members, Raymond? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Carroll? Weaver? No. Aaron Najarian? Yes. Uh, then we have 3A, and uh, I, I just... I just want to make a statement that um, that lady hasn't sung yet, if you pardon the uh, idiom. Uh, if the state takes away redevelopment funds and takes away prospectively and or retroactively, we're going to face some challenges with this project. So we are all, you know, keep the champagne on ice or keep the neon in the pressure tank for now. Uh, because we just don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of our uncertainty and a lot of our, you know, the apprehension that you see up here as the council and the agency is not knowing what's going to happen. Is this going to be the very last dollar of our redevelopment money that, that we can spend? Or is this going to be taken away from us uh, if we do make an appropriation? On, on that um, note, a little editorial. If you're watching this meeting, if you're sitting in this audience, if you think Mona and its relocation to Glendale and the investment here is a good thing, you should be speaking to your state senator and assembly member and asking them to support at least the California Redevelopment Association proposal for continuing redevelopment. Okay. Move on to the next item, please. Three, Director of Community Development regarding Eastside 
Brand Boulevard Improvement Project Schematic Design and the Pedestrian Passage and Alley Parking Lot Improvement at 3A's Agency Motion Directing Staff to proceed with the design and development phase. This is what we just heard, was it not? I just want to check, Mr. Mayor, with staff again. Along with C and D, am I voting for this too? For the this guy? Uh, Mr. Weaver, this is for the approval or next phase of the design of the passageway, so not related to the lease. Right, I want to make sure. Okay. Hey, can we have a motion, please? I'll move it for the agency. Second. Roll call, please. Uh, agency members, Raymond? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Montero? Weaver? Aye. Chair Friedman? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's. Um, I did have a card from. Pietro, you still like to address us? I'll take a motion to reconsider. Is there a motion? I move, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second, with no objection, the item is back on the table. Thank you Mr. for Di allowing Pietro. me to speak. My name is Dennis De Pietro. Um, uh, my family owns the property uh, south of what will potentially be the passageway down to Colorado Boulevard, and um, just wanted to uh, make mention of something that. Uh, Council Member Weaver said, mentioned about the chess park, and one of the failures of the chess park has been the fact that it is a, a narrow uh, space that's bounded by tall buildings on either side. Um, first, I'd like to laud the staff for moving this forward from what began uh, as the uh, town center uh, uh, project. And uh, But a couple of the design objectives. Um, one is the issue of retain a substantial portion of parking and it seems in talking with staff that there will probably be a net loss of about 30 parking spaces which is a significant number but the other uh, design uh, objective is uh, the design also provides opportunity for uh, the southerly property to extend the activities into the passageway and that's that's us and uh, just like to make note that uh, we really st strenuously object to the idea of building the 10-foot uh, wood uh, wall uh, along the south property line. Uh, we, uh, we have a permit in hand and are moving forward with uh, a major renovation of that building. Uh, and uh, part of that renovation will include uh, the removal of about uh, 11 to 1,200 square feet of of building in the back in order to uh, not only uh, uh, develop six code parking spaces, um, but also add uh, landscaping back there and uh, an area for patio. And uh, we, we indicated to staff that it, it seemed like it was very important to link the back of that building. The, the, we're going to be replacing uh, is, is a process is an exterior stair that would be brought in internal. The uh, the storefronts would be uh, consistent with the front of the building. We would be replacing all the windows on the on the second floor to be more historically uh, uh, sympathetic to what the building looked like originally. Doing a number of things to make that building uh, uh, really a, a significant little piece of uh, of. of uh, in the component of that east side of Brand Boulevard, and um, and we we see that 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 ten foot wood wall is uh, you know we have to wonder well, why should we even do that if if the if the design is going to literally continue that narrow alley approach uh, like Chess Park? Uh, it seems like there's an opportunity here for all of us to open that space back up. My time is up. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mr. DiPietro, I, I didn't see any fats on, except on this sketch here. I didn't find it anywhere else in the plants. Maybe it's there and I missed it, but... Yeah, there's a, there's a 10 foot high uh, wood. Okay, the point is that there was, during one of the presentations, it talked about outdoor dining along that side. Right. So I presume that it was in conjunction with any development you would do would open up onto that area. Right, and obviously there would but have to too. be... I don't know why put up a 10-foot wall if you're going to ultimately develop out. Now the question is, are you going to do it next year or 10 years from now? Whether we're going to do it? Yeah, when? Oh, well, uh, we, have to, we have to start construction within, uh, within 180 days. We've, we've got a permit in hand. We're moving forward. Oh, you're ready to construct? Oh, we're, we're moving ahead with that. Are you going to, I haven't seen any plans or anything. Are you going to 
be opening up onto that plaza or that walkway area? Well, we went in actually with plans showing openings in that plaza. The uh, building department wouldn't allow it, so they suggested that we eliminate that component until the agency de determines that de you're going to move ahead. Then we'll have to go back and we'll have to amend our permit, <laughs> allowing those openings. And we're fine with, with, with putting in the, those openings, which, which makes sense for all of us. We want to make that passageway as dynamic as possible. But the issue is we have about uh, 60 feet uh, behind that building that, that will be landscaped, we'll have a patio, and we'll have parking. And what we're asking the agency is to, to really rethink this whole idea of building a, basically a wall 10 feet high from, from, the, from the back of our building all the way to the, prop, to the back property line. You're, 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 in essence, already ready to pull a permit. We already, we already we don't pulled. need to come to the agency or the council for anything, right? We, well, we already got agency staff approval for the project, and we're moving ahead. You didn't need... You didn't need our it approval? didn't need to come no. to you. No. That's why you're doing it. Okay. That's We're not asking it. for anything. We just want to get it done. Okay. Can someone – thank you, Mr. DiPietro. But, uh, we, Mr. Tatavoshin, can you address the issue of the fence, <laughs> fence and as it relates to any future development on the immediately – Absolutely. Southern. Mr. DiPietro brings up a very good point. In terms of the TI plans that um, oh, they have submitted, given that the building department has to look at the existing conditions and uh, the subject property is still occupied by another building, they cannot be plan checking a plan that is looking at an existing building next door. As such, openings into another existing building are not allowed. But potentially when the project moves forward and that property, the subject property, is dedicated as a public right-of-way, at that point those plans need to be reevaluated and the doors uh, uh, are allowed by the building code to be um, to open into the, the public right-of-way. However, we are working very closely with the building department so that as they're plan checking the current plans, they are aware of the future uh, desire of the, the property owner to open into the passageway. Um, in terms of... I was just going to say, yes. Then it's which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, right now, they are moving forward at a pace that uh, is faster than uh, the, our project is moving forward. Okay. Given the building department has to look at the existing conditions, they cannot approve openings into a building that is still standing. I, I, I understand. Uh, but in terms of the 10-foot wall that Dennis – wow. <laughs> uh, I think I can handle the 10-foot wall. Uh, but in terms of the 10-foot wall, based on the initial plans that Mr. DiPietro had presented to staff during the design process, um, they are proposing to remove – the, there's an existing building without having aerials, um, uh, and I have to point to potentially this wall. is the wall that we are talking about. There's an existing single-story building ab ab right behind the, the double-story volume here. That building is going to be demolished and replaced with surface parking. Given the desire to protect the, the, the pedestrian edge, this wall is being proposed. However, that wall allows for openings into the exit into the the Pietro owned property. May I suggest you just put up a plywood fence. It's not a plywood fence. No, that's all you need if you're going to do construction. Hold on, hold on, Mr. Starberg. Is it fair to say that we'll have our design staff that's get with Mr. Yes. Pietro yes. and make sure that these two plan his plans and our plans are adequately coordinated? Thank you. You know, rather than designing them here. I'm not sure what he has plans or what we've seen, but certainly before we proceed with this design, we need to make sure we understand what his design is and what his interests are, and to the extent we can, we try to accommodate those. Okay. Yeah, the issue is that the 10-foot wall is to separate the walk, walking area mm -hmm. from surface parking. That would be, from an urban design standpoint, unacceptable for us to have surface parking there, and we will work that out. Absolutely. If they change their design in, in such a way that we don't have parking next to the opening, we can I, I understand Mr. DiPietro indicated he wanted to create some area for parking of about six cars and also a patio potentially for dining. Not knowing how all of those are going to relate, I think we just need to have our planning staff and Mr. DPH okay. on his Let's design get that. together. This is raising more that stuff out. That's where I was going to, uh, what yeah, I was going to, to conclude to with. Thank you. Uh, I have no other cards. Um, uh, can, I, can I just say that as it relates to what, this big investment that we're about to make with the Paseo, um, I would not like to see staff approving things like a surface parking lot next to this Paseo without it coming to the agency. Because I don't know exactly how it fits in with whatever they're doing, but that's a very disturbing concept to me. Yes. Um, I'll we'll, remove we'll, we'll look uh, item at that too. <laughs> 3A for the agency. I'll second. I don't know with direction to staff. 
with that. Hey, can we have a roll call, please? Agency members Draymond? Yes. Jarian? Yes. Quintero? Weaver? Aye. Chair Friedman? Yes. Move to adjourn for the agency. Second. We're adjourned? Move to adjourn for the council. Second. Actually, we have to go into closed session. Yes. That was a joint meeting. Meet. That was a that was a joint joint meeting. Right, I understand. We, we 